Uh, hello everyone. Thank you all very much that you came here to see my presentation. I know that there are some really good talks taking place at the same time, so um, thank you very much once again that you're here. And because you probably have no idea of who I am, I will tell a couple of words about myself. And my name is Bartłomiej Słota. If you find it hard to pronounce, you can simply call me Bart, if you like. And I am a software engineer from Warsaw, Poland. And I'm also a speaker and I run a blog. I am DZone's most valuable blogger. And the main areas of my interests are object-oriented programming, software craftsmanship, um, uh, microservices, and all the stuff somewhere around software architecture. And I currently work at Agile Tech, like you, you can see here in the slide and my shirt. And we are the technology hub of financial giant Hargreaves Lansdowne from Bl Bristol, UK, which is the largest financial service company in the United Kingdom. And Agile is looking after over 86 billion pounds for over 1 million of customers. And they opened a technology hub last year. And up there in Warsaw, we have currently around 50 people. But we have plans to expand to the number of 200. And what we are doing there is that we are developing software, with the latest technologies with the latest techniques, and we are bringing a lot of innovation into the company. And working there is a real fun, believe me. Here you can find some of my contact information. You can follow me on Twitter, you can visit my blog page, and all code examples that you will find there and during this talk, you will also find on my GitHub account. And don't hesitate and write me an email if you have any questions regarding this presentation or my articles or whatever. And if you're interested in my career, just visit my LinkedIn profile. All right, today we're going to talk about transaction synchronization and Spring application events. And I'm just wondering how many of you know Spring Framework? Hands up. That's a big number. And how many of you have professional experience with Spring Boot? That's also a big number, but because this talk is open to the people of all levels of experience, I will tell in a big, big short what Spring Framework and Spring Boot are. And Spring Framework, in a big short, is a Java platform that provides comprehensive support for developing applications with core support for things like um, dependency injection, transaction management, data access, messaging, testing, and many, many more. And Spring Boot, though, helps us to uh, develop production-ready standalone applications with embedded application servers like uh, Tomcat, Netty, Jetty. And it uses its magic to auto-configure Spring whenever it's possible, just looking at dependencies that we declare in our Maven Pwn file or in the build Gradle, or looking at the beans that we declare in our application context. And getting back to the main topic, application events in Spring Framework are a great way of communicating among beans declared within the same application context. And they can be even more powerful when they are used within the bounds of transactions. And during this talk, I will give you a real life, hands on example, explaining to you what transaction synchronization really is and how to implement it with Spring application events. You will also see with this example how can you possibly use it, when can you use it, and what are the threats that you should be aware of. And at the same time, I will try to focus on some simple. Uh, clean code principles that application events help us to follow. And at the very end, uh, I will also tell you a few words about even reliability and data consistency in distributed environments. And because I don't like slides, this is the last one you will see today. And we will switch to the IDE and do some live coding. But just before that, let's uh, imagine a simple business use case, which is based on a real one that I worked with in my previous company. And imagine a situation when you need to create a customer. And as soon as you create the customer, you need to generate an activation token. This token will be afterwards used in order to produce some unique activation URL. And this URL will be sent to the customer via email. And in those emails, we will encourage our customers to click the link, activate their accounts, and start using our brand new and shiny system. And from the business perspective, these two processes creating a customer and generating a token are two completely separate processes. What does it mean for us, the programmers, that these are two separate processes? Well, it means that when we materialize this abstraction and write our code, 
should follow the single responsibility principle and clearly separate these two concerns in the code as well. So let's move to the IDE and start to code our example. And what we have here is a simple Spring Boot application. And like you can see here, I'm using Spring Boot starter parent with the latest Spring Boot release version. And I also have a couple of dependencies over here, like Spring Boot starter test, uh, starter data GPA in order to communicate with the database. I also have an uh, embedded H2 database. Uh, we have also a couple of test utilities like Spring Boot Start Test and our utility, which is the library that I will describe to you in a couple of minutes. And let's move to the main application class and let's start with our example. Where to start with? Let's create a customer class. And let's annotate it with the entity annotation. This way we are telling Spring, uh, we, are, we are telling that uh, there is a mapping between the object world and relational world. And let's start with a simple field, call it ID. And it will be a primary key in terms of database. And let's say that it will be automatically generated with the strategy of identity. Identity. And let's also put here, I have a typo over here. Yeah. Let's also put here, let's say name, let's also add here email address, and let's put here the token as well. We may argue whether token should be placed here or not, and it probably shouldn't, as this is not a clear customer's property, it could be some uh, value object or some external entity depending on our use case, but for the sake of simplicity, uh, just keep it here. Uh, I will also create a simple constructor. Let's say that I would like to create my customer for a given name and email address. And because we are using JPA, we also need to create a no argument constructor, which is very bad. And let's also put some getters over here for ID, email, and name. And let's add some business methods into our entity. Let's start with this kind of business method. I would like to say to my customer that he will be activated with this particular token, okay? And the body will be as simple as the assignment. I will assign the attribute value to the token field like this. And another business method that I would like to have here is a method returning Boolean uh, that would tell me if my customer has token, has token or not. And I will put here the return negation of string utils is empty token. And you may be wondering why haven't I used just simple getters and setters over here. And there's a couple of reasons, actually. First reason is that we are developing in Java. And Java is object-oriented programming language. And every object-oriented programming language should follow its paradigms. And the basic paradigm of OOP is abstraction. And this is what we did here, is that we gave our object a real-life behavior. We modeled the behavior. So this is no longer a dumb and dynamic data store. It has behavior. And another reason for doing this uh, this way is that we have hermetized the data representation of a token. And secondly, we hermetized the logic regarding token, uh, regarding customer activation here in these methods so that it doesn't leak anywhere else. All right, now that we have our customer modeled, let's create a way to communicate with the database in order to persist the customer in the database and retrieve it from the database. In order to do so, we will benefit from using Spring uh, Data JPA. And it will be as simple as declaring an interface. Let's call it a customer repository. That will extend JPA repository for a customer object and for the primary key of type long. And with this one line of code, we gained practically for free methods like find all, find by ID, save, remove, etc. And let's create also a class where we can put some business logic. So let's create a customer service. Let's annotate it with the service method so the Spring Framework uh, creates a proper being in the application context. And I would like to have here a transactional method that would create customer, customer for a given name and for a given email address. And what I would like this method to do is to create the customer object, persist it in the database, and return. So we have to add here a dependency to customer repository. Customer repository. 
uh, I need to add a constructor like this. And I always prefer using constructor injection to field injection. And again, if you're interested why, you can catch me after the presentation and we can discuss that in detail. And like we said, we will create the customer object with the constructor. Customer for a given name and email, e email address. And we will return the result of customer's repository save method invocation customer. Yeah. And now that we have our service, let's write the test. I hope you already have the habit of writing tests, don't you? Let's write the test and check if everything works just fine. OK, and this will be a simple Spring Boot test, which will run with Spring Runner class. And because it is a test, it won't be a crime if I do some field injection over here. And I would like to have here a customer service uh, object, customer service. And I would also like to have here a customer repository customer repository like this and let's create the EJ unit test let's find some fancy name for it for example should create and persist customer okay what do we want to test here is that when we create the customer with the customer service create customer method for name like Matt and for email like Matt at gmail.com com then I expect that the customer that is residing currently in the database let's call it a persisted customer which I will retrieve from database using customer repository find by ID method using the ID from the newly created customer object and because this method returns an optional I also need to call the get over here and what do we want to check here is that our persisted customer has properly set properties. So let's make some assertions. First of which would be that name is equal to Matt. Get name assert equals Matt at gmail.com. Persisted customer get email. And because we haven't done anything regarding token generation yet, we shouldn't expect our customer to have a token. So let's write assert false here. And let's call persisted customer has token method. And let's check if we wrote everything correctly. The test will take a couple of seconds. Yep, and it works. OK, we can get back now to our code. And it's time for token generation. But remember what we said at the very beginning is that we need to follow the single responsibility principle. So it means that neither the create customer method nor the customer service at all shouldn't perform any logic regarding token generation. So where to put the logic in? Let's create another class. Class token, token generator. And let's also annotate it with the service annotation. And I would like to have here a method that would generate token for this particular customer. And what I would like this method to do is to create the token tell my customer that he will be activated with this token and persist in the database. So again, we need to have a dependency to private final to customer repository again. And we need to add a constructor. And let's create uh, the body of the method. So let's firstly calculate the token. And to keep uh, this example simple, I will just use the customer object hash code, all right? So I'll write like string value of customer hash code. And uh, forgive me for not paying too much attention to checking whether the customer object is null or not because it's completely not relevant from uh, the perspective of this example. And we need to tell our customer that he will be activated with this token. And we need to persist it with the customer repository save method. We're using customer over here and yeah and now we have a place where we have a logic regarding customer creation we have another class realizing token generation now we need to connect them somehow keeping in mind keeping in mind that we need to uh, have our code clean and decoupled at the same time so in this kind of cases a good idea was, would be to use the observer pattern so that we could inform all interested parties that a particular event took place in the system and in our 
uh, in our case, this will be like, hey, the customer was just created. If anybody is interested, do whatever you want with this. So following this consideration, we will use Spring application events. And Spring application events are nothing more than just an implementation of the observer pattern. So now the question is how to uh, model our event in the code. And fortunately, since Spring 4.2, we no longer need to extend the abstract application event class, and we can just use plain old Java objects. So let's write our class representing our event, and let's call it customer created. And let's also write the final over here. And what we want to have here is a ID of our customer, customer ID. Again, because if this field is final, we need to create a constructor. And because we probably will want to get this customer ID, we also add a getter over here. And we have our customer created event model. Now it is high time we start producing this event. So in order to produce the event, to publish the event in Spring Framework, we can use the application event publisher, uh, which is a super interface for application context. And this is also kind of an abstraction over the event bus. So let's get back to our customer service. And let's add another dependency over here. Right, final application event publisher. Let's call it a publisher. Simply, of course, we need to add it as constructor parameter. And we need to make some refactor over here. So let me remove the customer uh, object creation from here to here. And instead of having return statement, I will stay with the assignment. And over here, I will take the publisher and publish our event. Let's create the event, customer created, and pass the ID of the newly created customer object over here. And what we are missing here is the return statement with the customer. All right, we have just published our event. But in order to, uh, to be able to react to this event, we need to subscribe to it somehow. So let's write another class called customer created listener and let's say that it will be a component oh okay this is a component and i would like to have here a method that would simply handle the customer created event all right and what do we want this method to do is to take this event grab the customer's id from it then try to find this customer in the database using this id and generate a token for him so again we need to have two more dependencies over here, first of which is, again, customer repository. Second one is token generator, token generator. And of course, we need to create a constructor again. And let's create the handle method. So like we said, we need to take the customer from the database using customer repository, of course, and find by ID method. And the ID we will take from the event object. And because, again, it returns an optional, let's call the get method over here. And yeah, and now uh, we need to call the token generator and generate the token for this particular customer. Are we done? No. We are missing one thing, which is the event listener annotation. With this annotation, we are telling the Spring framework that this particular method, handle, should be invoked whenever a customer created event occurs in our application context. All right, so we have our event modeled, we have producer, we have consumer. So let's get back to our test and check if our persisted customer has token right now. Let's change the assertion to true. I hope it will work. And works. Fantastic. All right. So you have just seen that uh, Spring application events help us in following single responsibility principle as we have a clear separation of concerns over here. But at the same time, we are following also the open-close principle because if any other business requirements occur, for example, we need to react to the customer-created event in some other way, what we need to do is just add another listener. We don't have to modify anything in our code. but now, let's have a look at our event listener. And let's try to answer the question, do we have a real separation of concerns here? And the answer lies in the way the Spring framework handles application events. 
and by default, all application events in Spring Framework are handled synchronously. What does it mean? It means that our event producer won't proceed until all listeners are invoked, which means that if the producer is running inside some transaction, this transaction will be by default propagated to all its listeners, which in turn means that if anything wrong happens in any of our listeners, if any exception is thrown there, our transaction will be rolled back. What does it mean in our case? It means that if our token generation fails, our customer won't be persisted. So let's answer the question again. Do we have separation of concerns? We don't. But fortunately, Spring Framework provides something called transactional event listener, which is an enhanced version of an event listener that gives us the ability to collaborate with surrounding transactions. And here we meet the definition of transaction synchronization. And transaction synchronization is nothing more than just registering callback methods that should be invoked whenever our transaction meets particular phase. You may ask, what phases can we synchronize with? Let's open transaction phase class. And you will see the, uh, the phases. First one, before the transaction is committed, after it is committed, after it is rolled back, or after it is completed, regardless of the success. And what do we need in our case? In our case, when we are generating the token, we want to be 100% sure that our customer is successfully persisted. So we would like to use the after comment phase, which is also a default setting for transactional even listener annotation. So let's get back to our code and let's try to replace our even listener with transactional even listener, all right? Transactional even listener. And because we have a test, we can check if everything works fine. Let's rerun our test and hope it will work. And it doesn't work. Let's see what happened. Oh, our persistent customer has no token. What have we missed? Let's open another class called transaction synchronization. And let's try to read the Java doc, which should be done before using the transaction synchronization at all. And because we are using the after comment phase, let's have a look at the documentation that is written above the after comment method. And I see something interesting here. The transaction will have been committed already, but the transactional resources might still be active and accessible. And as a consequence, any data access code triggered at this point will still participate in the original transaction, allowing you to perform some cleanup with no commit following anymore unless it explicitly declares that it needs to run in a separate transaction. What does it mean? It means that we have synchronized our token generation with the transaction that has already been committed. So we shouldn't even expect that anything would be committed twice inside the same transaction, as transaction is an atomic object of work. We shouldn't expect that. So what can we do now? We can follow the advice given over here and declare the autonomous transaction. And are we okay with autonomous transaction in our case? I think we are, because we need to have a clear separation of concerns. We have a two separate processes doing something completely different. So if they run in separate transactions, we're fine with it. So let's try to do this. Let's get back to our code again. Let's find our listener. And in Spring Framework, declaring the autonomous transaction is as simple as using the transactional annotation and changing the propagation mode to requires new. And Again, because we have a test, we can check whether it works or not. And let's rerun it. And like you can see, declaring the autonomous transaction helped us uh, to get rid of the problem that is generated with the usage of the transactional event listener. And now, let's have a look again at our uh, listener. And let's imagine a situation when the token generation is a very long-lasting process. For example, it takes 20 or 30 seconds to execute. And let's also imagine that you give your end users a user form when, they're, when they can create a customer with two fields, name and an email address and a button. And imagine they face it when they need to wait for 30 seconds until their, their customer gets created. <laughs> Sounds insane. So in this kind of cases, the first thing that should come to your minds is to use the asynchronous tasks. And if we are talking about asynchronous tasks, transactions, and Spring Framework, what you should keep in mind is that in Spring Framework, 
transactions are by default thread bounded. What does it mean that they are thread bounded? It means that our, if our producer is running inside some transaction and it is starting some other separate thread, this new newly created thread won't belong to the previous transaction. So we no longer need to declare the autonomous transaction over here because it will be autonomous if we run any transaction over there. The transaction won't be propagated. So let's try to do it. And in Spring Framework, I could say that declaring a synchronous task is as simple as using the async annotation. And of course, I'm uh, oversimplifying a bit because this is up to you to manage all the thread pooling, etc. And of course, in Spring Framework, we need to also explicitly tell the Spring Framework that we need to enable the async processing with the enable async annotation. And because I said that we no longer need the autonomous transaction, we can get rid of it. And because this method will be uh, run asynchronously, we cannot perform our tests in a synchronous manner because we cannot be sure that, our, that the token generation will be finished before our test. So we need to change our way uh, that we uh, approach the, the testing style, right? So let's open the test again. And uh, now I will show you how can you benefit from using the awaitility library, which is as simple as that. If we can write await, import static, await. For example, we, we want to wait at most five seconds until, until some condition is fulfilled. In our case, let's call this condition customer has token. And of course, we are talking about the customer with this particular ID. And let's get rid of this piece of code for a while and let's create the uh, has token method. Uh, it should return the Boolean value. So let's declare that. And I'll paste the code again here. I will get the ID from the method argument, get rid of this piece. And instead of asserting true here, I will simply return the uh, has token invocation. And what our utility will do is that it will do the probing, will be checking if um, if our um, condition is fulfilled. Is it fulfilled? Is it fulfilled? Is it fulfilled? And if it is fulfilled in uh, within the period of five seconds, our test will pass. Otherwise, it will fail. So let's try to run it and check if it works. And uh, let's check if the asynchronous tasks uh, also deals with the problem of transaction synchronization with the after comment, after rollback, or after completion phases. And yeah, now maybe without any more coding, let's have a look again at our listener. And now I'd like to tell you a couple of words about even reliability and data consistency in distributed environments. And we won't dig too deep into details, as this could be a topic of a separate talk, but I would like to give you an overview of how complex the topic really is. And as you look at our event listener again, uh, what if I tell you that we managed to persist the customer, but right after that, and just before persisting the token, our database connection goes down. And in real life, <clears throat> some other business requirements may occur. For example, we may need to send an email. And what if we manage to persist our customer, but right after that, I mean, even my service is not available. It goes down. In both of the described cases, we lose consistency, right? So it means that our application events are not reliable and we lose consistency in the system. So what can we do to improve that event, consist uh, event reliability and data consistency in our system? Well, first of all, we want to be able to retry all those failed operations in the future. So in order to be able to do that, we need to persist our events somewhere and somehow. And now the question is where and how to persist them. And if we're talking about events, persistence, etc., first thing that comes to my mind is to use some JMS or AMQP broker like uh, Apache Kafka, RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, or whatever, but they may fail as well. We may have the similar situation like we have in our, with our um, email service. The second option that I would recommend is to, to persist all those events in the same data store as we store our customers. And we could even persist them inside the same transaction. And it would be the most reliable option. What then? 
then we could write a simple scheduled processor job that would take event by event and do the, the rest of the stuff, for example, generating a token, sending an email, or uh, forwarding this event to uh, AMQP broker or whatever. And you may also say that this also bears, bears the burden of not consistent solution. And I would agree. Because what if we take the event, try to send an email, but our email service is up, but it's not responsive, and we are getting timeouts. And we end up with sending 10 emails to the same customer. And again, we lose consistency. And it's a real problem. And how can we deal with this? If we are the developers of the event consumers, if we are the developers, for example, of the email service, we could write it in an idempotent way so that it can manage the duplications. And the last thing I would like to say to you is that um, what if I tell you not to persist neither the customer nor the token in the relational j database at all and to forward all those events straight to the AMQP broker? Then we could take all those events and re recreate our customer aggregate at any time in the future whenever we like. And at the same time, we could react to all those events, generating a token, sending an email, doing whatever else we want. And this, this is what we call an event sourcing. And here's where I'll leave you with all those considerations. I know that there are some talks today or maybe tomorrow about event sourcing and CQRS. And I really recommend you going there because this would be a natural continuation of my talk. And during this talk, you could see uh, on a simple example, what transaction synchronization is, how to implement it with Spring application events. Uh, you could also see how Spring application events help us in following single responsibility principle and open and close principle at the same time. You could also see uh, what transaction uh, transactional event listener is all about. And what I would like you to remember from this talk is that you can write your listeners both in synchronous manner and in a synchronous manner. But you need to remember that if you're synchronizing with after commit, after rollback, or after completion phase, there won't be commit procedure uh, invoked anymore. So you need to either use autonomous transaction or choose the asynchronous task processing. And with the async, you need to remember that uh, transactions in Spring Framework are by default thread bounded. And that's all from my side. Uh, thank you very much that you came here. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I apologize again for my voice. And if you enjoyed the presentation, then it means you should follow me on Twitter, definitely. And if you have any questions regarding this talk or whatever the topic is, we can talk afterwards. But remember, I'm losing my voice. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much.